Hello, students. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, we will be starting with today with the same chapter that we have uh, taken up in the previous class that is on the history of Buddhism. And on this chapter, yes, in the previous class, we have looked at how about the spread of Jainism, the teachings also on the uh, decline of the particular religion. We will come back to the major religion today that is on Buddhism. Everybody, uh, most of us know this religion and this religion is a very mild and a very, uh, very uh, mild religion that has been founded by Gautama Buddha. So we will look at it starting from the founder. Sixth century BC produced this religion and the original name for uh, Gautama Buddha, his real name was Prince Siddhartha. He was born in 563 BC uh, and he was a prince actually. His father was a ruler in a place called Kapilivastu in Bihar. He received very good education because his father uh, imp implied that education was important for him and he received from the Brahman teachers. He even studied the Vedic literature. But Gautama Buddha had his own strong personality because uh, by nature, his personality, it seems he was more inclined towards spirituality, questioning about uh, spiritual, and then he was always inquisitive about life and suffering and the cycle of birth and death. He got married at the age of 18 to a princess uh, named Yashodhara, Yashodhra, and he had a son. But all this luxury wife, a princess wife, did not give him peace and his mind was always restless. They, then, at the age of 29, after, at the age of 29, there were four men, four very uh, unique incidents that he came across. He saw a dead man, he saw a very sick, helpless man, he saw a very poor man, and he saw one religious man begging for food. He tried to study this fourth man and he observed that the religious man, even though he was begging food, there was some kind of a solace and a peace in his face. So this particular incident of studying the four men prompted him to take one very important decision at the age of 29. One night, he gave a last look at his wife and his son and the palace that he lived and he left them once and for all and for good. This particular incident of leaving behind his family, everything in search for truth, was known as the Great Renunciation in Buddhism. Because after this, Siddhartha, as he, was, as he was originally known, Siddhartha, he went searching for the truth. He, it is said that right after he left his palace, uh, he went to a forest called Rajgriha. There he spent two years with two Hindu teachers. They were very good, but still he was not satisfied with the teaching that he received for two years. And he joined a group of five aesthetic monks who were practicing severe penance and self-mortification. Siddhartha also learned about starvation. He, all, he said that he, when he was practicing the aestheticism, sometimes he was so hungry that when he touched his tummy, it could, he could feel his own spine also. But this practice also did not give him any inner peace or the real answer that he was looking for. So, Finally, on his own, he went, he left the uh, monks and went to a place in Bhotkaya, modern Bhotkaya in Bihar, on the banks of a river. He went there and it is, he, it is, said, in, it is said in history that he sat under a people tree for a very deep meditation. He meditated day and night and suddenly, 
For in the Buddhist religion, it relates that in that particular place, he received enlightenment when the deep meditation was going on, and he realized and understood the truth that he was looking for since his childhood. This incident in Bodh Gaya, where he received enlightenment, from that time onwards, he received the title name, not as Siddhartha, but his name was changed into Buddha as we know him, and Gautama as the religious preacher of this religion. After this enlightenment, the incident of enlightenment, he got the courage to, uh, to go around and start preaching his Buddhist sermon. He gave his first sermon, it is said that, it is said that uh, in a deer park, uh, in a near Benares, in a place called Benares in Bihar again. He was from Bihar, he was born in a place called Lumbini in Bihar. So his, his initial years of Searching the truth was centered around Bihar only. So his first sermon was also in a place called Benares. Then from that time onwards, for the next 40 years, Gautama continued to preach his new ideals, ideals and religion for the next 40 years till he died at the age of 80. So uh, we see here that he went around all over India. Initially, when he received his enlightenment and he went, started preaching and giving out his sermons, he concentrated mostly around the Gangetic Plains, that is in uh, Uttar Pradesh and in Bihar. So after re receiving the enlightenment and after having learned many uh, teachings since his childhood, he began to preach his ideas. And so we will now look about the teachings. We will look some of the teachings of Gautama Buddha. Teachings. He followed a number of uh, uh, principles that he had developed on his own by realizing the truth. The first sermon that he gave in Benares, that was, his, uh, that was his doctrine. And that is considered to be the kernel, or you can say the seed of his teaching. And the first sermon was known as the Four Noble Truths. In these Four Noble Truths, he preached uh, on four truths, on four truths, the first truth was Life was painful, life is painful. The second truth, he said, pain in life is caused due to desires, that is called Trishna. And uh, sufferings, to the, to the noble truth that he taught, the suffering could be removed if one knows the cause. And the sufferings could also cease only if one knows how to control that. So that was the Four Noble Truth. And it is said that uh, when he gave the sermon on the Four Noble Truth uh, in Sarnath, he attracted five disciples immediately with his first sermon, and that five disciples became his first follower. And that was the starting point. Some of the important uh, teachings that Buddha gave, the most important uh, teaching or his doctrine was the middle path. The middle path has another name that is, we will look later on, uh, the eightfold path, the eightfold path. But initially before the eightfold path, he emphasized on the middle path. At the time when Jainism preached about aestheticism, and at the time when the Hindu religion during that time where a lot of pujas and yajnas and expensive complex worship was going on, he, he had a feeling that he would introduce the middle path because to, the, to him, he preached that too much pleasure or too much pleasure or comfort in life does not bring peace or too much uh, extreme penance does not even bring peace or the truth. Only a line between, this, between these two extreme, a middle path will help a person or an individual to receive nirvana. Nirvana, to the, to the preaching of Buddha, it is said that this has been held as the highest 
point where a Buddhist had, have reached his religion or inner peace, where one is have a feeling, where one have a feeling that he is he or she is free from the cycle of birth, from the cycle of birth and death. The eightfold path, the noble eightfold path, is included in the middle path. To follow the middle path, one has to follow the eightfold path. And the principles that he laid down here are the eightfold path, right view of faith, right belief, right speech. In the right speech, one has to be polite and truthful, and one should abstain from lying, slander, abuse, harsh words, and idle talk. Right action, right living, right endeavor, right collection, and right meditation. Meditation to concentrate the mind on the right things was preached by Buddha. So I hope, uh, students, uh, you will be able to get all these points in page number 73 and 74 for the teachings to have a, uh, to, for you to uh, make a note later on also. The next important point in the teaching was Nirvana. I don't have to elaborate here. Nirvana means a Buddhist is a Buddhist or a follower of Buddhism has reached, received the highest teaching of Buddhism if one achieved this Nirvana. Because the belief is to free from the cycle of birth and death. What is the freedom from the, um, freedom from the cycle of birth and death? Is that there is, no world, there is no craving for worldly desires. There is no craving for any, uh, they don't feel delusional or they don't feel um, pain, but all peace that is called, that is considered to be the highest esteem. And in order to have nirvana, Buddha also followed the, or taught on the law of karma, the good karma and the bad karma. For a Buddhist, Buddhism, in the teaching of Buddhism, the good karma, again, has the same principle as nirvana, free from birth and death. The principle or the law of karma in the bad karma is <clears throat> a man Will reap, its own action, uh, will reap its own fruit from its own action, and the way he lives in this earth will determine his next life. The bad karma follows that if the life that one leads is not to the dis discipline that it has to maintain, then a person will go into a rebirth, having a second birth again. And to the Buddhist, Rebirth happens because of ego and desires. So this was the teaching that Buddha gave. He also, but another teaching of Buddhism is no belief in God. No belief in God, just like the Jains. But the Jains believe in the existence of soul, but Buddha, Buddhism does not even believe in the existence of soul. Another is he did not have belief in the pujas, the Hindu, Hindu the expensive Buddhism, uh, expensive pujas that the Hindus were carrying on that time. So no belief in sacrifice or yajnas. Another one of the very good uh, teachings that Buddhism gave but was that he did not believe in caste system. To a Buddhist, the caste system was a social disease. Division of society was a social disease. And lastly, the most important point is on morality. He taught on good morality, that is love, that is on love, benevolence, mercy, forgiveness, charity, and truthfulness. So these are the kernels, or you can say these are, this is the main points on the teaching that was given out by Buddha. After he gave out his sermons and teachings, it is said that Buddha could attract a lot of followers. A lot of followers, including from the royal family to the common people. Buddha, Buddhism attracted a number of people from the lower class, the Shudra, as I've explained in the previous class, the Shudra class, the untouchables, because he emphasized on no caste system. So he, after he had gathered a number of followers and his religion was, became famous. 
and was being accepted around Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and most parts of India as the religion was getting spread. He had, he had to have an organization which was systematic and that is called the Sangha, just like the Jain Sangha. But here in the Buddhist Sangha, in Buddhism, Sangha means the brotherhood of Buddhist monks. It is a brotherhood of Buddhist monks and it is based on the Trinity. The concept of Trinity for a Buddhist is, first is Buddha, second is the Dharma, and the third is the Sangha. Based on these three principles or the Trinity, the Sangha was run. The Sangha in the English word, it is called, it is monasteries for monks and nuns for this believer or the followers of Buddhism. When he organized or when he introduced the Sangha, he invited both men and women above the age of 18 years, but there were certain principles. Both the men and women, first of all, they should be free from any disease, especially leprosy, and they should not have any criminal records or nor should be serving in the service of the king. They should be a free man above the age of, above the age of 18 years. And he emphasized on this because he believed in the purity of physical as well as the moral of the monks where they had to carry the noble services. In the, in the Sangha that he originally introduced, both the monks and the nuns, the monks were called the bhikshus and the nun, lady worshippers or the nuns were called as upaskas. They, in order to enter into this organization, they had to take a ceremony that is called the Buddhist initiation of the Buddhist monks and nuns. And it was a very simple ceremony. All of them, they had to cut their hair, hair short and wear a yellow robe. And they had to take a pledge, a pledge that is based on the Trinity. They have to recite, I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in Dharma, I take refuge in Sangha, and they became a member of the Sangha. Now, after, the, after they are included into the Sangha, the monks live in the monasteries that were called the Viharas, and the nuns, they lived in the nunneries. There was a separate uh, hostel-like hostel -like maintenance for all those monks and nuns that were included here. The Sangha was run on democratic principles. They were strict rules and regulation and meetings and decisions were taken in a group. It is said that if anything has to be, any decision has to be made, at least 10 members of the Sangha were to be, uh, were to be present to make the decision. Life of the monks and the nuns were not easy because they had to refrain from all uh, possessions of gold or silver or private property, no contacts with the family, and the Sangha was the all in all till the end. And they also had a very strict rule for food. They could take only one meal a day. It is said that if they miss out the meal for the day, they have to take it only the following day. So these were the strict rules that was initially started by Gautama Buddha into his Sangha. Buddha did not live a very complicated life. He's, he, he tried to preach humanity and he, and he preached about uh, simplicity, that is simply, uh, simple living so that one will free from the desires of this world. He died at the age of 80 and at a place called Kushinagar in Bihar. After his death, a number of changes took place also, and we will look at that. The good impact was after Buddhism was introduced and after his death, Buddhism, Jainism got confined within India, but Buddhism went out of India. And though the birthplace is India, Buddhism did not gain much importance within India. It went out to the Southeast Asian countries and the neighboring countries of India, examples are like Tibet, Burma, Thailand, China, 
Vietnam, all the Southeast Asian countries, they adopted Buddhism. And another uh, important result after the death, a very important result after the death of uh, Buddha, after, the, after uh, Buddha, Buddha died was, though it, there was a long gap by the first century, like the Jainism, Buddhism also got divided into two portion. One was, the first was called the Hinayana, and the second was called the Mahayana. The Hinayana was called the Little Wheel, and the Mahayana is called the Great Wheel. The Hinayana continued the orthodox teaching of Buddha. They, they did not want to get infiltrated with the new teachings, uh, and they continued to follow the main ideas of Buddhism. But as for Mahayana, uh, they, they were more relaxed and they tried to bring changes so that people, they could attract more followers. As time passed by, in the Mahayana section of the Buddhism, they also introduced idol worship. Idol worship, not as a new god, but Buddha. The statue of Buddha or the idol of Buddha was introduced into the worship of this Buddhism. So you will find here uh, in many places also the Mahayana section of the followers, you find the temples where we have a lot, number of stages of Buddha, particularly in the, attached to the temple. So these are the, the, this is two important points that you can note on, on the changes that, was, that came about after his death, a very important impact. The legacy. The legacy of Buddhism. If we look into this matter, there is a very wide subject, and the legacy could be felt in many areas, religious, political, cultural. Yeah, cultural and education. Asian countries, in Asian countries. So here, the legacy is felt in a number of different ways. One important point in the political influence was the legacy was, when we talk about the political influence of Buddhism, it starts from Ashoka the Great. Ashoka the Great, he changed his life after the Kalinga War, and he came, uh, he, he got to know uh, Buddha, and he learned his teachings and listened to his sermons, and that is how he changed his life. In the political influence, you will see that it was Ashoka later on that he patronized and he promoted Buddhism to a large extent. And they, he contributed, he made donations, and he, he spread missionaries even to Ceylon, Burma, out of India to propagate his religion. That was the impo important political impact that was left behind by Buddhism. In the field of education, most of the monasteries in the Sangha, the monasteries and the viharas that was used by the monks at the time later on with the passage of time, this monastery became centers of learning. As not learning in the lower scale, but higher learning, and universities, it turned into universities. Best examples of educational centers were like in Taxila or the Nalanda University. Nalanda. Okay. Nalanda University. And foreign students from all over Asia and even from Western countries, they came around th this university to have to learn higher education from these places. The greatest legacy is felt outside India, in the Asian countries. If you just have a proper uh, general knowledge, you will be able to get where, the, you can just have a look in the general knowledge where Buddhism is spread in Asia. You will find that a, a number of uh, evolution has taken place in the Asian countries in the, uh, in the field of Buddhism, in the style of worship, or in the, in the way they approach their belief in Buddhism. So this is the legacy that has been left behind by Buddha. So I hope class, it should be okay for you to understand in this very simple subject, you just have to continue reading your textbook. Now, coming to this, uh, to the,
topic that has been given in your textbook, it does not end only in Buddhism. There is a particular point, small point here that is called Sanchi Stupa. Why has your textbook mentioned Sanchi Stupa? Because this particular word Stupa has a very big meaning actually, and we will look a little bit on that. Stupa, it is a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit word which means heap or mount. The meaning is Sanskrit word is heap or mount. But in Buddhism, Sanjay Stupa is actually a burial mount. It is a cemetery. You can see that. It is a grave, not cemetery, it is a grave of Buddha. And but this we will see what, what, what it is. According to the Bud uh, uh, in Buddhism, stupa means the burial places where the remains, the bodily remains of uh, Buddha, the items that he used, the object that he used, or the relics that he used are buried. And on top of that, a kind of construction is taken place. There is a mount with a tomb, and it is usually covered with a ring as a fencing, and there is small gates in the north, south, and east. There are four entrances. And the belief on Gaut uh, the, the reverence that was given to Gautama was so much that Ashoka, he said he gave patronage and he, had con he, he, is, he is the one who has constructed a number of stupa. And one famous of the many stupas that we see, the Sanchi stupa stands out. By Second century BC, it is said that the number, the stupas that were constructed were around places where Gautama Buddha was born, where he gave his sermon, where he received his enlightenment, and where he received nirvana, that is, near, that is the death at Kushinakar. So stupas built at, stupas were built at Sarnath, okay class, and Amaravati, Amaravati, uh, Sanchi, Sanchi, which we will look in this topic also later on. And places like Bharut, etc. It is said that in Sanchi Stupa, the stupa was constructed, was originally commissioned by Ashoka. And the first, stupa, there are three stupas here, the first stupa, was constructed by Ashoka and it is stated that in this first stupa, the ashes, the cremation ashes of Buddha, the legend says that cremation ashes of Buddha uh, was laid there where the stupa was built. We will see into detail. These are all historical monuments today and these were discovered. A little these were discovered, and we will see how they were discovered. All right, class? If you, uh, if you turn to page number 80, page number 80 and 83, you will find the pictures of how a stupa looks that will make it very clear for you. Discovery age or the discovery period. Amaravati stupa is a burial mound where the, some remains of Buddha has been kept, maybe an object and relics. And this was discovered by a British, uh, British officer. He was a commissioner at a place called Kundur in Andhra Pradesh. And it, this Amaravati, Amaravati stupa is located at Andhra Pradesh. When it was discovered, it was found in a little damaged it was in a little damaged state. And when, uh, when this British commissioner, his name was uh, Walter Elliot, he, dis he, he when he saw this place, he said that he has discovered one of the best magnificent and the best example of the art and architecture in the, in the, in the sphere, in Buddhist, in Buddhist art and architecture. That was the command that he gave. There was a little twist in the story in Amaravati. Sadly, when the officers, British officers, when they found the place, they took away the sculptures and they took away the sculptures and also the 
some of the relics from these places. But now, this Amaravati Stupa is under the preservation of the Archaeological Survey of India. Most of these relics, you will find some of the sculptures, relics, and the stones you'll find even in the museum in London, some museums in Calcutta, and in Mumbai. The Bharat scale was, di was discovered by uh, an, another British man, Sir Alexander Cunningham, in 1873. The Bharat stupa, it is said that it was only 68 feet in diameter, and when it was discovered, it was in a very damaged scale. So what they did is that they removed most parts of the stupa, and this stupa, a model, uh, this stupa is now taken to the Indian Museum in Calcutta. So if one wants to look, we have to go to Calcutta to, to look at the Bharat stupa. The Sanchi stupa, as your heading gives, why was it so important? Because it was the largest. And when this Sanchi stupa was discovered, it was still in a very good state compared to all the other discovery that was made. This is us. page number 80. This is the Sanchi stupa. It is not a building, actually. It is a burial ground uh, that contains small items of, that was used by Buddha. But the followers, they wanted to give it, make it so sacred and a place of pilgrimage. So they have constructed a big, kind of a big mound that was surrounded by, even by fencings. Uh, Sanchez Stupa was also discovered by another British man. He's, um, he was a British army officer, his, uh, General Taylor. He discovered all the one, two, three Stupa as we know today. And it is said that uh, Sanchez Stupa uh, he, it is located uh, 48, kilometers, uh, 48 kilometers east of Bhopal, again in Madhya Pradesh. So we have to go to Madhya Pradesh to look at, have a look at this great monument. So, uh, Taylor, he, made, he laid the foundation and he said that he has also made another great discovery contributing to Buddhism. Sanchi Stupa is a very, uh, has a very romantic connection at the same time because uh, Ashoka, it seems he found a bride from a place called Vadisha and in order to commemorate his love uh, to the, the one of the wives that he took from that place, said that he, he commissioned to build the first stupa as he had become a convert to Buddhism and to show an exemplary side that his uh, attachment and his sacredness to that religion can be portrayed through the construction of the first, uh, first stupa. And here, uh, the, the ruins was found in such a good state that you will find that uh, in the 19th century, there were Muslim rulers. San Sanchi Stupa was, was well preserved by a Muslim ruler, Begum Shah Jahan, and her successor. They took care of this place, saying that we are from Bhopal or Madhya Pradesh, and we have to take care of this great monument. So the credit is given to um, Begum Shah Jahan for taking care of the Sanchi Stupa. Sir John Mar Marshall, the, gr the governor general of the Archaeological Survey of India, in the 1920s and 30s, he went to this place and he saw that even Begum had constructed a guest house and a museum nearing to this place and he stayed in that guest house and he praised the, the care that was taken by these Begums in preserving this particular monument. So we have come to all the important stupa. I hope you have also understood what is a stupa and uh, students, if you go to Google and if you particularly type all the names of all these stupas that I have mentioned, you'll have a clear picture of what it is and maybe you can get some extra knowledge from there. And as for today, we wind up and we have closed with this chapter. Stay safe, take care. <laughs>